warning. Listening to this show may result in increased levels of inspiration, motivation, and innovation. Side effects can include the immediate urge to take massive action to build a better business and life for yourself and others. You've been warned. Welcome to Influencers Radio with your host, Jack Mize. And welcome back to another episode of Influencers Radio. Today, we're going to dig in and go pretty deep to the good and the bad and the ugly around internet marketing, online marketing. So many people have fascinations with making money online and businesses that are even, you'll see, there are going towards exclusively running online. And even today, the local most mom and pop shop often have an internet presence, an online, an e-commerce, even if it's a simple click here and here's where you send the check. Online marketing is become, you can almost take the online off of it now because it is the marketing. Today, my guest is a person that has seen the evolution of online marketing. He's seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and we're going to dig into this because it may not be all the roses and rainbows that you see. Uh, because my guest today is the founder of JV Zoo, which is an e commerce uh, startup, which in the first three years, the, uh, his clients have generated over $150 million in revenue. And he's also the author of the new book, Millionaire Within. With that, let me welcome to Influencers Radio E. Brian Rose. Great to be here, Jack. Well, I'm glad you're here. And I'm also um, going to press you a little bit on on some of the stuff that goes on in the online world and the realities uh, of the online world. And, and I think you're up to it because, you know, you, you, you don't pull any punches in uh, your new book. So let me put it as bluntly, when you see things out there, whether it's infomercials, there's ads on the internet about making money online, I can only distill it down to, they say it's easy, but it ain't. <laughs> let's, let's dig right into into that, the, the, the realities of, of uh, businesses going online. Sure. Well, first of all, there's the old saying, you know, you're an internet marketer or you're an offline marketer. You know, you have a brick and mortar business. Right now, all roads lead to the internet. I mean, this is the year 2015. Everybody has the internet in their pocket, not just on a big bulky computer on their desk like they did 20 years ago. It's in their pocket. People are at red lights on the internet. People are driving down the highway on the internet. They shouldn't, but they, they are. Everywhere you go, whether you're standing in line in McDonald's, somebody's on Facebook, somebody's uh, surfing the web, somebody's on the internet. Uh, anybody, uh, just about anybody under the age of 70 is on the internet. Most of the day, they are linked in, wired in, whatever you want to call it. So if you have a business, and I'm not talking about an online business, if you have a business, any type of business, even if you're the guy that cuts people's trees down and you don't have an online presence, then you are missing the boat. You are decades behind the rest of the world because in today's world, every single business owner should also wear the title of internet marketer. Well, yeah, and, and that is the case. And I was saying that that it's almost like you can take the internet or the online out of the word marketing now. It seems to be uh, that if you are marketing, period, that seems to be a big chunk of where your focus uh, is because that just seems to be where the world's attention is. Um, Absolutely. When was the last time you used the, you opened the yellow pages to look up a phone number? Oh my gosh! Yeah. Well, it, it, I, I I think that we get the yellow pages on the porch every what nine months, and I think every time my kids still say, "What's that?" It, it goes straight from my porch to my trash barrel. I haven't had a yellow pages in my house in, in over ten years, probably, because everybody looks up the businesses online. Yeah, exactly. And and one of the things I want to get into because you have a tremendous vantage point, and you've seen a lot of things that. Uh, most of the world, even the most famous, you know, online entrepreneurs haven't seen because of your uh, your startup, JV Zoo. 
which this e-commerce marketplace, you know, $150 million uh, worth of sales that have gone on over uh, three years. You've probably seen a lot of different ideas. You've probably seen tremendous successes. You've probably seen tremendous failures. Um, I think of shows like the Shark Tank. Most people are familiar with the Shark Tank where every week, you know, they get pitched, you know, maybe three ideas and, and everybody that watches that show probably secretly has that idea, you know, their own idea that they think that they can hit it big. You probably see what 300 ideas oh, yeah. a week Hundreds. and you get to see them either blast off or go down in flames in real time. Uh, give us some insight into that and, and maybe kind of what you see the whys, uh, if there is sure. a why that happens. Sure. So just to give kind of a synopsis of what JV Zoo is, it's an online marketplace where people that sell digital downloadable products, anything from ebooks to video courses, how to uh, membership sites, and even software can list their product online uh, on the marketplace. And our army of affiliates will now promote those products in exchange for a commission. So they, they might have a mailing list that they mail out to. And the trick is when you can have the greatest product ever, the best software that does everything that every business owner wants software to do. And if you don't have the sizzle to sell the steak, then you're not going to get any traction. You're not going to attract the affiliates that are going to promote it. You're not going to attract the buyers uh, to your website. I, one of the questions that I get often is I'll have somebody come to me and say, hey, I have this training course or I have this piece of software. It's very similar to another piece of software that's being sold on your site. And they have tens of thousands of sales. And my software is actually much better than, than theirs. It has more features. It has, uh, it's a, has a better price point. It's lower. It's half the price. I don't understand why I only have a few sales and they have tens of thousands of sales. And that's where it all boils down to one word. And that is marketing, how you market yourself, how you market your product. You know, and, and I, I, I say this, 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 um, this, I don't know what you <laughs> the sizzle is better than the steak. Sometimes, you know, I don't like using, uh, you know, phrases like that, but it's the truth. You know, you start with a great product or what you think is a good product. And this, this goes for anything, whether it's a digital downloadable product or you're a real estate agent selling a house or you're a car salesman. You, you start with a good product that you think is worthy of selling. And then you have to build the sizzle around it. You have to sell it. You have to market it. And if somebody else has a lesser product than you that is not as good as yours, but their marketing is better than yours, they're going to win a hundred out of a hundred times. And it's as plain as simple as that. The way you market yourself, the way you present yourself, the way you present your products that you're selling, that has a major impact on the amount of sales that you're going to make. Well, I think, you know, McDonald's has probably proven that for decades in the, 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 the real world that, the marketing is much more important than having the best product. No offense without, to them. Without question. Uh, yes, yeah. without question. So no, no offense to the, the McDonald's lovers, but I, I don't think that that's debatable. So, but the one thing that I think is interesting and that you bring a perspective that most people may not see if they are, you know, they, they see Shark Tank and think that this is how, products get launched or this is how someone goes from their garage to, uh, you know, a multi-million dollar business is that they're on Shark Tanking asking for an investment. They're asking for startup money or they're asking for expansion money, uh, often in the range of tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so I think it's stuck in a lot of people's minds that that's just what it takes. It takes money to to make money. But you have seen uh, people just have meteoric rises of success with less than not even tens of thousands, not even thousands of dollars, hundreds of dollars, tens of dollars uh, starting up. No, for no dollars. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we live in, uh, you know, the, the information world. And one thing that will never go out of style 
that will never be affected by the economy. There will always be a market for information. That's why I love the people that sell information online, whether it's in the form of an ebook, whether it's in the form of a, a physical book, whether it's in the form of a membership site or video training courses, things like that will never go out of style. And they come from within. Everybody knows something about something. And, it, and if they don't know, they can do the research online and learn as much as possible and then create an info product, as we call them. Uh, that is basically a product with nothing but information on it. And I see it never goes out of style and will never uh, be affected by the economy because what happens when, I mean, for example, in a great economy, people are looking to spend their money. So you might have info products on, you know, how to dress better, how to buy a better car, how to, you know, negotiate the lowest interest rates when you're buying a house, you know, things of, of that nature that deal with spending money when, when the economy is good. When the economy is bad, well, info products that shine during that time is how to find a new job, how to negotiate a raise with your, with your boss, um, how to find investments that suck in a, yeah, that, that work in a sucky investment environment, that kind of thing. So you tailor the, 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 the products and uh, the products are tailored to the environment around them. Information never goes out of style and information is free to put on paper and turn into a PDF or shoot a video of yourself. You know, we all have professional video cameras in our pockets these days. You know, the, the, uh, the iPhone camera is used so many times to create uh, info products and video membership sites that couldn't, you know, that you couldn't have done this years ago. I remember when I first started making videos, I invested thousands and thousands of dollars in professional video equipment that were lesser quality than what's on the iPhone right now. So you can actually make videos in your own house and sell them online with information that you know. So you really don't need the tens of thousands of dollars in, in startup capital that you see on TV that people are conditioned to, to thinking, hey, I need to get an investor if I'm going to do anything. You know, information marketing is a multi-billion dollar a year uh, marketplace, and it's something that just about anybody can sink their teeth into. Well, I think in large part, it has to be a big thanks to folks like you that have made that available. And I, that's what I want to kind of dig into a little bit is because that opportunity is there for people to do that. And sure. like I said, one of the reasons is because, um, you know, someone like you uh, has this idea and puts together this concept of like a, a JV zoo, which is actually a platform that allows people to be able to do that and not just a place to sell their stuff, but to also have kind of a built in um, salespeople, if you will, with that. And so to, to put together a concept like that and to go from idea to implementation, that's something that you would almost think you'd have to be hit somebody up that's like a shark tank or some type of venture capital funding because that's got to take uh, a, an enormous amount of, of money and funding to do this. So if someone is thinking in those lines, surely it takes uh, some funding or financial backing to do that. What type of uh, venture capital funding did you have when you started up the JV Zoo? We actually had zero funding and we didn't have a large budget. When I first came up with the concept, I actually went out shopping uh, for programmers. I'm not a programmer, I'm not a coder. I just architected what I thought a good affiliate network website should have in it. So I started calling around the coding companies and getting quotes and they were ridiculous. To me, they seemed ridiculous. Anywhere from 50000 to $1 million were the, were the uh, proposals that I was getting back. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm going to need financing for this. I'm going to need to take money out of the bank. I'm going to need to get VC money, which I knew nothing about. So I, I said, you know what? I, I don't think that I'm in a position where I can get any of those things. So I just started looking for coders that could possibly want to partner with me, that saw the vision. And again, I was either coming up short with the talent that I was finding or the people that were talented enough uh, to do the job just wanted no part of, of, of it. They said, no, I'm not going to invest my time in something that could fall on space. And it was just a chance 
conversation that I had with Brian Zimmerman, uh, who was a fellow internet marketer that was doing a, a little bit of business with me at the time where I, I said, finally, I just, I'm going to tell somebody about my idea. And I told him about it. He thought it was a great idea. He threw in a couple of suggestions that he had. And he said, Hey, you know what? We met Chad Castleman at an event last month. We got him on a three way uh, call and, and the rest is history. We, we decided to all three of us partner together and make JV zoo a reality. Now going forward, we didn't have a big budget on how, uh, you know, to market it. And we were going against some stiff competition. There, there were companies that are similar to us that have been around for, you know, 10, 15 years uh, prior to go back to the 90s. And we had to start thinking outside the box, you know, so that we didn't have to go get that venture capital money or borrow some money. So what we did is we used some outside the box thinking and came up with a great plan to use social media to blow our brand up. And within the first month of us, you know, attempting these kind of tricks on social media on Facebook, it worked. Uh, everything that we were doing, uh, you know, I'd be glad to tell you a couple of the tactics we used. Uh, well, I do, but I, I, I want to bring up something really quick because I think uh, what you said was a bit of an understatement when you said there were a couple of companies that did things similar to you. Because from what mm -hmm. I've seen, you, you, this concept that you had, there were companies that owned the market in in right. the area that you did. So not just similar companies, there are companies that people thought that this is the company going up and can, trying to compete with them would be a suicide mission. You know, why would you even yeah, bother? It was a, it, yeah, it, it was a Davy and Goliath situation for sure. There's no doubt about that. There were a couple of companies that basically owned the marketplace. And we just thought that, uh, you know, one, we could build a better mousetrap. We could build a better system. Uh, I actually went to one of my competitors and gave them a laundry list of ideas that I thought they should implement into their system to make it better. And the response that I got was, you know, I really don't have much competition. These are great ideas, but uh, I think I'm good more on that. And, you know, it was that kind of thinking that kind of made his business fall down a flight of stairs when we actually came out and, and started making, uh, making a mark. Yeah, so this kind of so took you, over that marketplace. So you, you, right there, I think, is where a lot of people stop. You had a great idea. You knew you could make a better product, right? Um, and that's what people think. A lot of people think that's what it takes. All I need now is to, for somebody, a shark, to give me some money, and we're off to the races. But the fact is, even though you had the better product down, you still had to convince people that uh, to, to not just that what you had was a good idea to try it, but you had to convince people for, to actually move from those de facto, from those, those Goliaths to uh, JV Zoo. Now, how did you do that without that funding? Because most people would think that that would just take a tremendous marketing budget to launch something, not just a new idea, but to launch something that was actually going to compete with someone that had s such a, a strong foothold uh, on the market uh, as it was. You know, I believe in the power of perception and persuasion. And if you can put into the people's mind the perceived value that you are a bigger company, a better company, more reliable company, and offer a better product, then they're going to believe it. And that's what I set out to do. So we started with a $2,500 budget, $2,500. We went to an internet marketing uh, conference in Raleigh, North Carolina, and decided to throw a party for about the 200 people that were there. But before you could get into the party, you had to stop on our $50 red carpet and our $100 step and repeat sign, which was uh, the backdrop. The step and repeat sign is those signs that you see in the back of uh, the red carpets uh, at the Emmys or the Grammy Awards that have all the sponsors uh, logos on them. And it just had the JVZ logo over and over and over on it. And you had to stop and get your picture taken on the red carpet before you could enter the party. We then took those pictures and tagged every single person that walked into the party on Facebook so that it showed up on their, on their news feeds. Now in person, it looked like this cheap rug and this cheap banner, but 
on on uh, the photographs, it looked like this was a lavish red carpet event thrown by this very lavish company, and it just made us look larger than life. So we started tagging everybody. It shows up on their news feeds, the, the people that were tagged, but not only theirs, but their friends. We didn't throw the party for the people that were there, and I even told them that at the time. We're throwing the party for your friends so that they can get a load of the J- JD Zoo brand and see this lavish party that's going on. We had a photographer take pictures at the party as well. Each picture that went up online was branded with the JVZ logo burnt into it uh, as a watermark. And these pictures went viral. Now, now not every one of their friends that saw it is in the internet marketing world, but you know what? People of a, a feather flock together, so a lot of their friends were. So we got... A lot, you know, we got a lot of exposure for a very little bit of money. It just, we, we continued doing this with two or three events after that. And we credit our first 10 to 15,000 members of our website to just throwing two or three of these parties, uh, starting with a $2,500 budget. When we launched, we were profitable from day one. You know, we convinced people to come over and start listing their products. And it's tactics like that that we just scaled up and used social media. Uh, Eventually, we threw our own big party in Orlando and we brought in some famous celebrities, uh, like we brought Coolio in to do a concert in Orlando and we brought in a lot of our members of JV2. And the reason we picked Coolio was he was very uh, unmistakable. He was was affordable, first of all. We could get him for kind of cheap to perform a concert for us. But when people see this guy, he, he's got like the, the little uh, braids that stick straight up out of his hair. And when you see him on TV or you see him in pictures, you know exactly who he is. So he's the kind of guy that people want to get their picture taken with because he has that famous appeal to him. And that's exactly what they did. We had the, uh, the people that came to our party do the bidding for us. So they wanted their picture taken with Coolio. They took pictures of him on stage and every picture that went up had JV Zoo logos all over it. So now we have the crowd doing our bidding for us and just little things like that that we scaled up. We were eventually able to bring in, uh, you know, do it again a year later with, with Vanilla Ice. We did it with Tone Loke um, a few months later and we just leveraged our our members and our uh, people that came to our parties that we threw and leveraged their um, ability to share things online. You know, the whole Brian Kramer shareology concept, where if you can get your customers to share your brand, you're going to grow faster than the guy that's spending a million dollars on advertising. And we learned that to be the truth because we've never spent a dime on advertising since the beginning of the company. You know, that, that's re- remarkable. I mean, it really is to take $2,500 in an idea and three years later have, you know, $150 million worth of revenue go through your system uh, with, with no ad budget, you know, using these types of tactics. Now, um, to go back to the beginning of the show, you talked about how, you know, brick and mortar businesses, uh, you know, a lot of people look at what you're doing and think, well, you know, this is, this sounds like the, the classic overnight internet success, but you've also seen how these tactics work in, in other fields. How would people use those types of tactics that you use to move people to JV Zoo from a, what many would say was an, you know, unsurmountable competition, uh, and apply that to, you know, the, the guy that's the attorney, the guy that's the CPA, the guy that's the, the restaurant, the guy that, you know, runs, you know, a, a midsize, even, you know, both brick and mortar online. Will these tactics work outside of that classic Internet startup launch? A- absolutely. Absolutely. My, my daughter is uh, 11 years old. And the thing that all 11 year old little girls in America and probably around the world do is they share pictures on Instagram and Instagram. They say, Oh, there's no advertising on Instagram. Well, there is a t-shirt company that sells monogrammed t-shirts on Instagram. And every time you buy one, they ask you for your Instagram login name or username. So when they make your t-shirt, they'll take a picture of it and share it. 
And she found this company because a friend of hers bought the t-shirt and they mentioned her when they took a picture of it. She's 11 years old, got all excited and, you know, shared it with all of her friends. My daughter comes to me and says, I want one too. I buy her one. And the next day they make her t-shirt and they put it online and put a tag her. So it shows up on her feed and for all of her friends feeds. That is a perfect way of viral marketing. This company has no ad budget. They do all of their advertising through viral marketing like that. When somebody buys something from them, they take a picture of it and tag the person and the person, it's almost like my daughter thought she was famous, you know, and I know she's 11 years old, but that never goes away. That feeling doesn't go away. It works with adults just as it works for children. Uh, another example, I had somebody come up to me the other day saying, hey, I have a, a clothing boutique that I'm about to open. What can I do to get some, you know, and I don't have a big ad budget. She, she thought about doing local targeting on Facebook, but she really didn't have the budget to do it. And I gave her the red carpet idea. And I said, just have everybody before they walk into your store, have a grand opening party, invite all of your friends. So you have 20 friends that walk through and they take a picture on a red carpet, make it look huge. And then you share them on Facebook. You know, that's a tactic that can work for anybody. That's a tactic that can work for real estate agents that do open houses. You know, you're having an open house. Share pictures. If you incorporate the public, the possible, uh, the possible buyers and your actual customers into your advertising campaigns, and when I say advertising campaigns, I use that loosely because we're talking about free social media stuff, it is more effective than if you use a paid actor or anything like that because people love to see themselves on TV, on advertisements, on the radio, wherever it is. Everybody wants to be famous. And if you give them that little taste of, of fame, they will, you're buying their loyalty, but you're also buying their shareology, if you will. They're going to share it with their friends and say, hey, look at me, look at me, look at this place. And that gets your brand out and in a positive way. And you can't pay for that. You can't buy that. You know, that, and that, that, that really is a, it's a brilliant. And to listening to, you know, how you explain that. Um, I think back to, I, I don't even remember what the product was. The, the, remember the old commercial about, you know, the, you, you do this and they'll to tell two friends and they'll tell two friends and they'll, t- what was that? I can't remember. It could have been toilet paper, whatever that commercial yeah. was. It was a shampoo, you know, show two friends. But what you're doing is, is, is you're not even having to rely on them telling two friends. You're saying, here, you buy this and I'll tell your friends for you. Exactly. You don't have to rely exactly. on them referring it, but with, I guess with the with social media and understanding the, the depth and the reach that that has by doing that, you, you're actually doing the sharing for them, which is, is I think remarkable. And I can see how that can uh, just spread very rapidly without uh, a budget. Um, and, and, and without a sleazy sales message, you're putting out a positive message just by spotlighting somebody that they know and they're going to hit the like button. They're going to hit the share button. They're going to retweet it, whatever social media uh, platform you're on. They're going to share the stuff. They're going to hit the heart button on Instagram. And that is a positive thing. If, whereas you, if you just put out an advertisement on Facebook, you're not going to get the people to like it like you would if it was an organic social media share and it feels social media rather rather than advertising right and i said that you're you're truly chap uh, you know uh, tapping into an emotional aspect that i think uh can very very rarely be tapped into uh spending money with that through through traditional advertising to to be able to get that deep on emotional level with your uh your not just your customers but also the, the, the people that uh, look to them for referrals. So that's really is it's just incredibly powerful. Um, now, a lot of people may look at you and see just like a lot of Internet startups. Wow, they got lucky. Man, look at that. The guy, you know, sitting in his garage, sitting in his dorm room, came up with this little thing and it caught fire and he was uh, successful. You know, got lucky. You. I guess if if you had to 
put luck, inject luck into your story, it sounds like a lot of it would be bad luck. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And so, absolutely. so let's, let's just go back into this because I, I want to dig also into uh, your book, Millionaire Within, that it's not about, hey, you know, let's sit here and we, we, I'm going to show you how to make money in your underwear. The, the, a lot of the reason that you have the ability and the insight that you do into what makes something work and, and you know, what makes products sell beyond just the quality of the product is the fact that you've gone through a lot of trials and tribulations. You've gone through a lot of bad ideas. You've gone through a lot of good ideas that just weren't at the right point in time or the right place or with the right people. Um, so let's talk about that. You know, how many times you've been knocked down to still get up and to, to finally um, put it all together. So what, what, Kind of, how did you get into what you're doing as far as as marketing? You know, I I, I joined the military right after high school, and I immediately got sent to a couple of war zones. I was in Somalia, I was in Bosnia, and the one thing that I noticed while I was there was all the business that was going on around me. I was flabbergasted by the, I guess, the, the business of war and how many people were, were making money off of it. Just not, not the huge Halliburton type company. I'm talking about small entrepreneurs. Uh, we were a television production unit called Combat Camera. And uh, just to give a brief uh, example of it, on the one year anniversary of the Somalia invasion, we had a freelance uh, journalists come in and say, Hey, I understand that you guys have uh, classified and unclassified video footage. Uh, I'd like to exercise the Freedom of Information Act to get some copies of your unclassified footage. So he went through the proper channels, filled out the right paperwork, and we were able to give him uh, a tape that had about 40 minutes worth of unclassified uh, footage from the Somali war that was going on. He, I saw him the next day, and I said, hey, what did you end up doing with that uh, footage? And he said, well, I, I found a satellite truck, and they let me upload the 40-minute tape. Uh, I paid them $400 for the upload, and I sent it to ABC in New York, and they bought 20 minutes of the footage at $1,000 a minute. Wow. And I just thought, my God, I am so ready to get out of the military and start leveraging other people's work and, and doing, doing something to make my millions. And it was soon after I got back, I got out of the military and I decided that I was not going to work for anybody. And I was just going to jump right into business. And the first thing I tried to do was start a, start a, um, a video production business. And I had failed miserably. So I eventually had to take a job in it's just story after story of me walking away from having a boss, realizing that, uh, oh, this isn't going to work, having to go back to a boss. And it's happened time and time again. And, and some of the stories that I tell in the book are just me on the brink of something that's going to make multi-millions of dollars, but then something just falls apart and it, and it falls down, whether it was a bad partner that I was involved with, or um, just bad timing. And I will tell you this, the one of the you know, non-physical assets that I have that I am most appreciative of are my failures. Because every time I failed at starting a business, I learned something. And the most important thing that I learned from those failures is what not to do. And I think that's where a lot of people they, they, they'll have this catastrophic failure and they'll, they'll say, okay, I'm going to get back up. And they repeat it, the exact same thing again and again. They don't look at, they look at what they did right only and then continue to do everything, including the things that they did wrong. I always looked at it as what did I do wrong? What do I not do next time? You know, whether it's don't, you know, uh, don't partner with somebody before I fully vet them. Don't, uh, you know, don't, don't get myself into too much debt. Don't buy products that are too expensive and I can't resell for more money. You know, whatever it was that I screwed up on, I make note of that. And that's, that's what I kept doing. And look, I'm no guru when it comes to building businesses. I'm not this Harvard graduate or anything like that. I have a high school education and all I did was take a common sense approach 
to building businesses. And I made some mistakes that probably somebody with a little bit more education would not have made. But if I stopped right there, then I'd just be working for somebody else to this day. And it was just something that I didn't want to do. You have to have the drive. You have to have the outlook and uh, that, Hey, if I fail now, I can always do something later to make money. I think money is the biggest thing that people are, are afraid of not having, you know, and they have this big fear. Well, oh, if I'm not a success, I won't have any money. Well, you know, you only live once and you can't be let money hold you back from your dreams. If you lose your money, you get a job until you have more money to, to do the things that you love and, and continue trying until, until you finally succeed. That's, that's how I lived my life. Well, it seems that, that because of this, you, you know, you would, like a lot of people, you would chase things, you would see things, the opportunities. And, you know, I think that's going to make money. Hey, I see an opportunity. Here's someone that has part of the idea together. You know, all it needs is this. Let me jump in there and add this to it. So sure. even though you've created your own products, I think one of the, the, um, uh, the, the, the benefits that, that you have is that you've, worked with a lot of different types of products in a lot of different types of fields. And I think that's pro- probably one of the reasons why you've discovered that it's not just the product that a big part of it is the perception the, is the marketing. And you have to, you have to make that perception yourself. You have to create that perception. You know, I, I, I decided, you know, I had a television background. I wanted to start a, uh, a television, an online television show in around 2002 that revolved around the poker world because poker was getting huge at the time. I was a big fan of it, but nobody knew who I was. So all it took was me to get in bed with one solid person in the industry. So I befriended Daniel Magrano and talked him into doing a little segment on the show called Ask Daniel. Now this was before uh, Daniel Magrano was a huge celebrity on ESPN as you know, the most charismatic poker player in the world. So he was easy to approach. He liked the idea. And I started using that and leveraging his, you know, kind of fame that he had or notoriety that he had in the poker world to have people take me seriously. And I think that that is a huge thing that you can do no matter what career field that you're in, you know, kind of hang out with the people that you want to be associated with, associate your people yourself with the people you want to be associated with. And I call it the association factor. And if, if you want to get famous in your industry, there's thing, ways that you can find yourself aligned with other people. I'll tell you a, a quick story. When I first became an internet marketer, nobody knew who I was. I had been selling things online for a long time. I thought I had some, uh, I, I thought I had some, knowledge that I could share in what we call the IM niche, where we teach other people to sell online or provide them products to sell online. But nobody knew me in this business. So how was I going to make a a name for myself when people Googled me? You know, they weren't going to find anything that I was this big guru or anything. So I started making websites of the top internet marketers, simple websites. I used a WordPress site. And I made one that uh, was called Top Internet Marketers. And it was a list of 15 of the top internet marketers of our day. I had uh, uh, Frank Kern. I did a bio on Frank Kern was number one. Number two, I had one with Andy Jenkins. Number three, Mike Bill Same. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on. And I, and I named some of the most famous people in my industry. But in there, I put myself as well. E. Brian Rose. And I put my own bio on there of the things that I did online. And I just kept doing this over and over. And that's what I call involuntary association, where I kind of put myself in lists that other people in my industry were in. And you can do that no matter what you did. I sold hearing aids. That was one of my business ventures one time. And I, in fact, I private labeled them. And they were called Rosebud hearing aids. And they were made by the same company that made some of these hearing aids that cost three, four thousand dollars, but I was getting them at a very cheap rate and I private labeled them, but I wasn't allowed to use the name of this big manufacturing company. So what I did was something very similar. I made lists of the top hearing aid brands and I would put like Siemens and, and Belltone and some of the other big top name brands. And right next to that, I would put Rosebud. So it was that association factor that perceived value that these are the top 
brands in the world. And when people read this, they get the perception that rosebud hearing aids are also part of the top brands in the world. And you can do that for yourself. You can do that for your business. You can do that for your products. It's the association factor. Associate yourself with the things, the products, or the services that you want to be associated with. And and it's it's you know absolutely true. And I think you know you've you've uh, proven this uh, throughout your whole the, the whole history of your business and and uh, all the way through to the success of of JV Zoo. You mentioned a few minutes ago how you you know high school education. Uh, you know you don't have some Harvard education, but uh, it seems that places like Harvard are interested now in what. E. Brian Rose has to say, you know, we've talk, right. We've, right? We've talked about uh, info products. We've talked about brick and mortar businesses. Uh, but, you know, let's say people that are what speaking is a big part of their business. You, you're now one of the most sought after speakers on, on online marketing and e-commerce um, for events, for keynotes and even uh, for Harvard uh, University. How does the same perception uh, allow a guy that, uh, you know, in a not too distant past was selling hearing aids online with a high school education, uh, you know, get the ears of, of uh, someone that can book people at Harvard to talk about what you do. You know, it's funny. Harvard actually called um, called a friend of mine and uh, named Joel Com and, and and said that he wanted to put together some of uh, a symposium with some of the best social media minds in the world. And he gave a list of people that he wanted to see if he could put together. And my name was mentioned in that list. And I'll tell you what, like, like you said, I've been, I've been doing a lot of speaking uh, engagements. I love speaking in front of an audience. It's one of my favorite things in the world to do. Um, but I've mainly been speaking in front of internet marketing audiences and I see a lot of the same faces at a lot of the different places that I go and I enjoy it every single time. And I try to change up my, my speeches every time, but I grew up in Boston and I had a, I had a, I got two A's in high school. One was in journalism and one was in video production and the rest were not a vowel. It's a, <laughs> they were not A's. They were not bees. They probably weren't even cheese. Uh, so I had a guidance counselor who looked at my overall grades and said, you know what? Your best bet is to join the military. And I said, but don't you think that, you know, the fact that I was good at, you know, certain things, you know, that had to do with like, you know, journalism and, you know, video production that I have this creative edge, maybe that I should go in that direction. Not with grades like this. You need to join the military. And I was like, okay. And I did. You know, so I left Boston. And growing up in Boston, you know, Harvard is there. And it's always there. And you always see the Harvard logos everywhere. And, and for me, and that was just always, I always had a great respect for Harvard University. And in fact, when I used to skip school with my friends, we'd go out to Harvard and hang out in Harvard Yard. And, and uh, we just thought it was just really cool. Um, it was about a 20 minute train ride uh, was, um, uh, on the T to, to get there. So when I got this invitation to speak, it, I, I mean, I just, it, it was, it was overwhelming to go back to my hometown and speak at the most prestigious institution in the country. I, I just, it, it's overwhelming. And it, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, I can't wait to do it. It's, it's coming up September 12th and, and, it's just what an honor it was. So I love speaking. I, I never get nervous, but I think this is one event that I might be actually nervous uh, to be on stage for. It was, it was such an honor. Well, I, I don't think there's probably any stronger punctuation that we can put on the conversation today. As when you said, you know, you, you put your, your, your name, your own name on enough of your own list. You end up being your name going on the list that's sitting in on Harvard's desk to have you to speak. I think it's just <laughs> r r really remarkable. And that really is, if you look back at it, that's, that's almost the, 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 the chronology of it. You know, you had this idea, I'm going to associate myself, uh, perception, you realize the power of perception, making your own list and associating with you. And then the, the, um, I think, uh, pure, 
poetry, have you ended up on a list uh, to be recognized and speaking at uh, Harvard on you could be, the expertise? You could be the smartest person in the world. You could be have the greatest product in the world. But if people don't know about it and people can't be convinced that it is great or you are smart, you're never going to be asked to speak anywhere. You're never going to be asked for, uh, you know, somebody to carry your product or promote your product or, or a person to say, hey, how can I give you money to buy your product or service? It's not going to happen unless you use perception. And that is, that is the number one tool of a marketer is perceived value. You know, it, it doesn't matter how great your product is. It's what's perceived by the consumer or in my case, what's perceived by Harvard. You know, I have to be perceived as the person that can deliver intelligent uh, content to Harvard students. You know, that's something that I guess I got right along the way. And if you can get it right with a product or, or with a service, you have to just know the perceived value of the customer is the most important thing, aside from the quality of the product itself. Well, I can say along the way is certainly an interesting story. Millionaire Within, obviously, is is the book that pulls back the curtain on not just your success. And, and you know, a lot of people like to put the spotlight on the success and look how great everything is and how smart I am. But uh, also the failures, some of which we've talked about. Uh, tell me a little bit more about um, Millionaire Within and, and Let's let folks know kind of really what to expect, because it certainly isn't the, uh, hey, w- read this and you'll be sitting on the beach collecting, uh, you know, money in your in your in your bank account for doing nothing because the Internet is a magic money machine. Those are the types of books that that I was buying. I, I, I always, always, you know, kind of intrigued about writing books. And I thought, Hey, you know, I've written enough info products and eBooks that I could actually write a book. So I started buying other people's books and that's exactly what they were. You know, the picture on the cover was like palm trees and a beach, you know, it looks like a Corona commercial saying, Hey, this is how we make money on the line, you know, in our bathing suits. And I did not want to write a book about that. So one day I just started to write the stories of my business ventures and, and mainly, you know, the online ventures that started in the late nineties. And I started realizing I have some very interesting things that have happened. You know, one of the first companies that I got involved with, I I started, I I built a website for uh, a guy out in California and he said, okay, well I can pay you $5,000 or I can give you one of my Corvettes to drive home. I said, are you kidding me? So I drove home instead of going to the airport, I drove home in this 1973 convertible Corvette thinking I was on top of the world. What he wanted me to do was quit my job and come to work for him. He thought I had some great ideas and he wanted me to help him build his his startup. And this is around the time that they were raising huge amounts of money on the West coast. You know, anybody with a business plan was getting venture capital money. They raised, $9 $9 million. I quit my job. I went to work for him and I was fired three months later because they were running out of money and I'm, I'm back home going, what do I do now? Uh, so, you know, that, that's just, you know, how I started in this business years later, I, I Googled the guy and find out that he was in prison. He took all that $9 million and built this huge mansion and spent it on trips around the world and did all these things with the money. And that's why they ran out of money at the end ended up in prison. So I have stories like that. I have stories of Kevin Mitnick and the business that I did with him. Kevin Mitnick is one of the world's most famous hackers who, who tried to sell products on eBay and got shut off of eBay, kicked off of eBay. And I said, Hey, how can I take advantage of this? And I, I called him up and, did a little deal with him, made a press release and just sent it out on this free press release site back in 1999. I got a phone call at three in the morning with this woman screaming bloody murder. I have five minutes. I need a quote. And I had no idea what she was talking about. The next morning I'm in every major newspaper in the country. This little deal that I did with Kevin Mitnick from that I saw on a CNN news clip Uh, and just things like that, that, you know, some were chance encounters, some were, oh my God, this was so brilliant that he did this, but he forgot to do this and it all came tumbling down. And so many times that I almost made it, so many times I partnered with the wrong person. And my goal for this book 
Millionaire Within is that everybody that reads it, no matter what business you're in, whether it's online or, or whatever it is, that you take a list of not only the things that I did right and try to copy them, but make a list of the things that I did wrong. So I want you to have two lists when you're done with this book. And I think every chapter in the book gives a story of how I did this and how it either failed or how it succeeded. And I want you to have two lists of takeaways, you know, what he did wrong and what he did right. And you can make it monthly or write them down. Um, but everybody that's read the book has said one, one theme. They, should, they said, you have turned teaching into a Hollywood movie. And um, James Malinchuk actually wrote a review for the book that said it reads like a Hollywood movie. And I didn't, that wasn't my goal in the beginning. My goal was only to be different from the people that say, oh, it's all, it's all you know, butterflies and, and roses and, and you make money in your underwear or on the beach online. All you need is a laptop and everybody becomes a millionaire. That's not the case. There is work involved. And hopefully I gave the people that read my book, I gave them a good pathway and to open up their own ideas on how to actually execute the work. That's my goal. Well, I think that's only one of the reasons why um, I, I certainly can consider you as a, as an influencer. You know, the old saying is, is one of the best things you could do for business is learn from your mistakes. And I think what you've done is given people an opportunity to uh, not learn from their own mistakes, but learn from me by Brian Rose's mistakes, which, um, seem to be well documented and uh and ones that I think if people can just learn from those they'll probably be miles ahead of where they could be. So how can people find out more about uh Millionaire, Millionaire Within and uh, E Brian Rose? Sure. Um they can go to millionairewithinbook.com and that's where they can get a copy of the book. Uh or you can learn more about me at ebrianrose.com, very simple. And uh there's Plenty of goodies to to read on both sites, and I hope to see you all there. Well, I have to say, um, I certainly appreciate you you coming on today, Influencers Radio. I think uh, certainly we we see why you are considered an influencer, not just for building the 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 business that you've done, to building JV Zoo to what it has become, but also because you built a platform that have allowed so many other people to change their lives and so many other people to uh, have success of getting their products out there, their information out there. Um, and, and also for the people on the other end that have been able to improve their lives by the products that they've purchased and they've learned from um, you, you truly have in the same aspect of the way that you went viral with your marketing. I think you've gone viral with your influence and, and, uh, really changing a lot of people's lives. So thank you very much for, for, for being on today. Thank you, Jack. You know, if you can build a business that actually helps people and, and in my case, you know, JV Zoo, where, where we don't make money unless our customers make money. That's an awesome feeling, you know, to grow rich together and, and build something together. If you can build a product, whether it's, whether it's a tangible product or it's an online product that enriches people's lives, and you go to bed at night thinking, hey, the people that bought my service or bought my product actually benefited from it, whether it's, you know, to, to improve their business or improve their personal life or improve something that made them feel better about themselves. That's that's a great way to go to sleep at night. And I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have built something like that. And I will continue to build businesses that, that serve because that's where the money's at. And that's where the wealth is at. If you can go to bed feeling good about yourself, you are wealthy to begin with. And if money comes along with that, even better. Powerful words, indeed. Um, definitely check it out, millionairewithinbook.com to grab a copy of Millionaire Within and also more with uh, E. Brian Rose at ebrianrose.com. Once again, thanks for being on Influencers uh, Radio today. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate it. And. Until next time, remember, you are the only real game changer. You've been listening to Influencers Radio. To get all past shows and updates on future shows, visit InfluencersRadio.com today. Or follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Influencers Radio.